The whole collaborative design environment really does set the stage uh, along with the very fast pace approach both for uh, getting equipment and making decisions. And uh, Elon makes it very clear what he wants to have accomplished and then the teams work together uh, looking at the different subsystems and how do you how do you uh, make compromises where you need to to achieve the the result that Elon wants and um, one of the things that really enables that is the whole incentive structure at SpaceX and this is one of the things where we have I think uh, some real challenges when you get into an established bureaucracy established bureaucracies tend to have certain organizations certain silos and the the incentives for the people working in those organizations is to benefit their particular organization. And uh, so in the mix, the overall goal of the program can get lost relative to you know, making decisions that benefit certain parts of the organization. At SpaceX, uh, Elon was very aware of this, and so he deliberately uh, would not pay that high of salaries a large part of the compensation for anyone who went to work at SpaceX was, uh, was stock options. And so your real compensation comes when the company succeeds. And that does a lot to align um, essentially business goals and interests that even if you're a, a propulsion individual, you want the TPS to succeed because if the TPS doesn't succeed, then the company doesn't succeed, then your stock options aren't worth anything. So it creates you know, a, a collaborative um, situation where people are, are pulling all towards the same goal and they're willing to make compromises. Um, one of the interesting things that I witnessed is that on the first Dragon capsule, the C-1, there was a problem with one of the bulkheads in the pressurized um, volume that uh, one of the bulkheads had been undersized. And the structures group actually came to the TPS group and asked if they could place a spacer to put some of the loading of that bulkhead onto the TPS structure because we had margin in the TPS structure. And I mean, I would never, you know, see something like that at NASA. You'd go and redo the whole bulkhead. But what they wanted to do, they wanted to get the capsule out. And they had done the analysis and said, okay, we should be okay on this capsule to uh, transfer some of the loading, you know, from the bulkhead to the uh, TPS su support structure. And again, that you know, allowed them to go forward. And the TPS guys took a look at it and decided, oh, yeah, it was within range, and so it was no problem. Um, and again, so that type of collaboration of give and take on the different design, um, you know, challenges and solutions uh, allows you to really move along quickly. And the other piece of it has to do with really the, again, the rapid pace of both acquiring information and uh, system data and making decisions. And... Uh, um, I had this one situation which has been related in several other uh, areas, but I think it's worth noting. When I was first working with SpaceX, um, probably a couple months in, and this is one of the first uh, meetings that we had to make a decision on maker buy for the uh, heat shield, for the peak heat shield that was going to be used on Dragon. And uh, um, I was still the new kid on the block, uh, but we had a, a design meeting, must have been about... 10 or 11 engineers and Elon, so we had all the major subsystems represented, uh, propulsion, TPS, structures, avionics, uh, and then Elon. And so we, the group was discussing whether, you know, make or buy for, for this TPS material. And I was at that time just listening because I was the new kid on the block and, okay, seeing how do they, how does this, how does this uh, um, type of an organization function? And at one point, Elon looks over at me and says, well, Dan, what would you do? And so I explained to him, well, based on what I'm hearing, you know, I would actually do a, a, a make, not a buy, and, and here are the reasons for it. Um, explain that it wasn't that hard a process and that it would allow uh, them to optimize the peak of both for Dragon and then also have the capability for making TPS for future needs. And uh, so after explaining this for about... Uh, uh, three or four minutes, Elon leans back. No one says anything. Elon leans back and says, that's what we're going to do. And that was the end of the meeting. And everybody stood up and left the room, and I was somewhat shell-shocked, like, what? 
And this was the first meeting we had on this. It's, you know, we hadn't had any prep meetings. It's the first time that we were all together discussing this. And that was it. And everyone walked out the door and went to work on, okay, how do we make Pika at SpaceX? It took me several days to get over that, that, wow, okay, did I say the right thing? You know, um, you know at NASA, we would have had, you know, many meetings uh, looking at, okay, what are the options? You know, what are the, the metrics we need to be you know, concerned with? What, what are the in impact on other subsystems um, before we came to a, a, you know, critical decision of make or buy on a, on a very important component? The other example I'd like to point to is the uh, once we did the make decision for PICA, we had to set up a TPS lab, and literally from scratch. I mean, what we had was a uh, a large room uh, because the facility at Hawthorne was very large, but we had a large section of, of the facility with essentially concrete floors, you know, walls and lights, and that's it. I mean, it was n there was nothing in. Uh, that shop at all. And over the course of nine months, it went from literally an empty space to a world-class TPS production facility where they were producing four blocks, large blocks of pika uh, in a big oven um, at, a, at, a, at a single um, time, so a big batch mode, and much better than any of the outside vendors had uh, had developed to that point. So in the course of nine months, it went from being essentially an empty room to having the best peak of fabrication facility on the planet, nine months. And again, if you would have told me, um, based on my NASA experience, you could make that much progress, I would have said no way. You know, maybe 18 months if you pushed really, really hard, but we did it in nine, in nine months. So that was uh, quite astounding. So the whole pace of development is just at light speed compared to what you're used to in traditional aerospace. And it really does take uh, a number of months to get used to that, um, to get used to how rapidly things move, how rapidly decisions are made, the whole, you know, try it, verify, move forward, or, or step back approach, and the whole collaborative design environment um, between the different subsystems. Again, one of the design approaches uh, SpaceX uses is rapid um, prototyping and test and failure. And uh, I'll give you one example that actually I thought was, was quite interesting. Um, one of the times we had a little difficulty between uh, two groups um, had to do with the uh, temperature limit that we were looking at for the bonding agent for the PICA um, heat shield to the structure. And we were given a number from the structures group that looked low that they wanted, you know, we had to specify that the bond was below a certain temperature. And we were suspicious that that number was too low. And so we went and talked to the, the structures group. And said, oh, no, no, no. The, the, I still remember the gentleman saying that um, this, their, their, the uh, composite structure that they're using for the carrier structure for the TPS, it turns to butter above this temperature. And myself and another gentleman were walking away, and we said, we don't believe that. And this, this uh, gentleman actually was uh, Andrew Chambers. He said, we're going to test this. And we had this big oven that we, where we made the, the pika billets, and it could go up beyond the, the temperature that we wanted to actually use, and way beyond the temperature they said was the limit of this composite. So Andrew actually was able to go get some samples of this composite, we set up a jig, okay, and this took like, you know, one day, okay. So we got these samples. We set up a jig in the oven where we highly loaded these samples so that they were under great strain at room temperature, okay. Went out of the oven, closed the door, and cranked up the temperature, okay. So we first cranked it up to the point where the gentleman said, this turns to butter. And what we would do is that uh, we'd open the oven, run in and measure the deflection because it's hot in there, and then run back out and close it again. And... Uh, so we first got to the temperature, we said it turned into butter, okay, and they hadn't budged at all. And then we went up to the temperature that we wanted to use, and they had budged a little bit, but hardly at all, okay. So then we went back to this gentleman, okay, in the composite group and said, well, you know, we just ran a test relative to these limits you were giving us. It didn't turn to butter at this temperature, you know, it looks like it's fine up to this. And that's when the gentleman said, well, yeah, well, we can, but we just can't trust you guys. So we were, they were giving us an artificially low temperature because they were worried that we would, that we would uh, 
you know, violate that temperature limit. But what actually brought that to light was this rapid prototyping. We literally did this in a day, okay, with the things that we had available, okay. Just, we went and did it and just, okay, you said that it turns to butter here. We're going to check that and see if it does or doesn't, you know, and it didn't. And that's an example of, of how they work, okay. If someone gives them a requirement or some type of a, a parameter, um, they are prone to, well, let's see if that's the case or not. Let's put together a jig. Let's put together an apparatus to see if we verify what we've been told. Does it work this way or not? And they can do it very, very rapidly. And what happens is that you're able to learn very quickly. And, uh, for example, another one that we did on the way to uh, scaling up Pika, when we, to go from essentially an empty room to a world-class, you know, Pika shop, Pika factory, we did it in three phases. We first did the uh, um, first phase, prototype phase of things about the size of a coffee cup, just so we could transfer the process to the SpaceX team. Okay, here's how you make peak on small scale. Then we had to go to uh, a scale up of a full size billet, but we did that with a prototype unit, and because we had some concerns about temperature uh, requirements and uniformity, and so we built a prototype unit. It took us about three months, um, but we built a, a, a custom furnace that we could monitor very accurately the temperatures, uh, the, the, the state of the material in the device. And after doing several billets out of that, we were able to then go and design the, the full scale um, facility. And, but it was going through and very quickly doing you know, try this, does it work? Okay, learn, go to the next size, go to the next size. And at each step, <clears throat> we learned very important things, that were things that were working and things that weren't working, things to watch out for. We had a couple of gotchas on the uh, full-scale billet prototype that we were able to resolve. We were seeing some funny behavior for a while on, on how some of the, uh, the, the solvent that, that's part of the process uh, on how it was modifying the phenolic. And we were scratching our heads for a couple of weeks, and we ran some tests and found out what it was and modified the approach and got it to work on a full-scale billet. And by the way, I should mention, that was the first time that anyone had ever done a full-scale PICA billet. Um, even the outside suppliers had not ever accomplished a full-scale billet, and we were able to do that through this prototyping. But you know, doing that rapid prototyping and testing um, it allows you to identify, you know, what's important, what are the things that you don't know about that are going to bite you, and uh, address them early on before you go to a full-scale facility <clears throat> where now if you have a problem, now the, 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 you know, the options you have to fix a problem are far fewer and far more costly than at a smaller scale. So that, that was one thing that you'd see over and over again. Uh, they do it on all sections. I saw that in the TPS area, but they do it for structures. They do it for engines. They they try to prototype at the smallest scale that they can initially and then work their way up to, to full scale and do it as rapidly as possible uh, with 51% <laughs> confidence at each step along the way.